grateful that you let me come to the secret garden.
we are here as your church. We are the redeemed of the Lord. And we say so. We are bought with the price, the sacrifice of the one and only Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who shed his blood for us, took upon himself all of our sins, our iniquities were laid on him. And the price was paid in full. Paid in full. The debt is gone. And we are free, free from sin. Free from, from, from the lake of fire. Not only free, but we're also rewarded. We also are made more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Thank you. We are the redeemed. We are the church. We're called out of this world, out of the darkness. Set apart. We have a destiny to fulfill. We're walking in that destiny. We are fulfilling your purposes for our life. What an honor it is to be a part of the body of Christ. I don't want to be a part from the body. I don't want to be away from the body. Any body part, not with the body, is grotesque. If you see a hand lying in the street, severed from a human body, that is a horror to behold. You see a nose removed from someone sitting on a park bench, that is a, a horrible, horrible idea. It's the same when God sees his children not connected to the church. He is the vine, we are the branches. Without it, the connection, without our place in the body of Christ, there's no flow of life, there's no flow of life giving a water, or the blood does not make it to us. So I want to be connected, connected. Show us our part in the church. Show us our part according to your grand design. Yeah. Our role, yeah. our purpose. I want to function in the will of the Father for us. I want it to be my everything. I don't want to do anything other than what the Father wants me to do in the church. We see the book of Acts filled with people, filled with those that are fulfilling purpose and destiny at any cost. Families having to flee from their homes because of persecution, preaching the gospel everywhere they went. We see such a, an amazing story of your spirit hard at work through the lives of people who no longer saw this world as being what is important, but saw the kingdom of God as their priority. To represent that kingdom in the church, to live as the ambassadors of Christ. That's us, Lord. As we continue to read the book of Acts, open our eyes. Open our eyes to see the details. The details. We're excited, excited to be a part of that. Yeah. Bring us on this road of discovery so that we can fulfill the acts of the church, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your outline with you, you can see page one. There's the whole introduction. I think most of you have been here in the class already, but if not, you can A, read through it in your own time, B, go to YouTube and watch the, all of the sessions building up to today's session and follow it through as we, as we move along. It's very exciting. I'm getting, there's a lot of people in the nations that are watching this series right now. And um, I praise God that they are being able to learn and grow from it. So we want, we want to be a blessing to the church, but to the whole world. And we want all the churches to grow because I think this is a message that needs to be heard. I think this is a theme that has to be adequately covered in the church house because it is, as I say, our heritage. And so we, we've been discovering the purpose and the objective of the class and in the outline, we've already made it through the introduction and the church in Jerusalem. We saw the birth of the church, the summary of that church in Acts 2. And then we went into the, the church ministering in Jerusalem and we saw the difficulties they had with some bouts of racism, internal problems, uh, other things happening, interesting things. And then, of course, the persecution in Jerusalem when Stephen was martyred. And this 
caused an explosion of growth because after that, of course, the church scattered because there was authority given to Saul of Tarsus as well as others to go house to house and arrest and persecute every individual. It'd be like the government of our nation. Suddenly, it is illegal for you to to teach or preach about Jesus at all, and it's so illegal that they've decided that you will be arrested and put in prison for it, and maybe even uh, be hung in Changi. You know, imagine if all of a sudden it got that serious, and that's exactly what happened in Jerusalem. And this is the city that Jesus walked around and taught in, and it's getting very serious. So they had to flee. A lot of the families had to run away. Only the apostles remained in Jerusalem to continue doing what God called them to do there. But the people fled, and as they did, they preached the gospel everywhere they went, scattered throughout Palestine and Syria. And this is the fulfillment of Acts 1.8. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses in those areas, in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And so we see this process, the church scattered. We were talking about the ministry of Philip last year. We were together, and we begin reading the first part. If you remember, we talked about um, Philip in Samaria, and specifically we talked about the fact that uh, these are the things we covered. Philip in Samaria, that's where he. we saw that he ascended, that he used to be a deacon, but now he's an elder. He is an evangelist, and he's doing a wonderful job while he's there, and of course we know that there was a run-in he had with, with uh, the man there, the sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer, saw that when Peter and, and the others came that, that, that they could lay hands on people and they received the power of the Holy Spirit and Simon offered money for it. And so all of that's interesting in the development and the unveiling of the kingdom on earth. It's basically, whenever you see the church in action, it can be summarized like this. It's a collision. It's a collision. A church meeting is supposed to be a head-on collision between time and eternity. It's where, it's where God's dimension meets the dimension of time. This age collides with eternity. And in, in, once that collision takes place, it's kind of like that, that ripping meteor that tore through the Russian sky. If you haven't seen that video, yeah. wow. So much force was taken off that meteor to hit 33,000 mile an hour projectile, hit the surface of the atmosphere of the earth and just disintegrated, but then a concussive wave flew in through the air, because the air, you know, when you hit air at 33,000 miles an hour, it's like a brick wall. So when it hit it, it just shattered and that concussive wave come down and shattered all the windows. And, uh, you know, I couldn't help but think of end time scenarios and how easily, if, if, to fulfill some of the scriptures that we see and what happens in the skies and, and it, it would be so easy. And it, I think we're going to start to see more and more signs in the heavens to fulfill what's written in, in Joel. And the, in the last days, you know, we're all happy about pouring out of the spirit. Read beyond that. Blood and fire and, and terror. These things that I think are going to start to get the attention of, of people. And it certainly got the attention of the Russian citizens that heard that that day. And a lot of people were wounded, hundreds of people were wounded by flying glass and debris because when they heard the, the, uh, the saw the bright light, which if you saw in the videos, it's like, you know, like an atomic bomb. When they saw that bright light, they all went to their windows to see. And then that shock wave hit and blew glass into their faces. And that's where most of the wounds come from people looking out the windows to see why, you know, something as bright as the sun quickly moved over. But if you haven't seen the videos, go look at that. And, and I really believe that it is a sign of things to come. And that we're going to see more and more signs like this that are going to shake the population of the earth awake out of their dormancy and their spiritual ignorance and start to realize that, that God is real, His power is real, the kingdom is upon us. And um, praise God. I'm not afraid. I'm not. I fear only God. And come what come... And, uh, be whatever may be, my God reigns. He rules and He is the Lord of my life and I'm an agent of His and I'm going to continue to do that. And the church needs people filled, uh, needs people that are filled with this concept, with this assurance and this understanding. Philip is one of them. Peter's gone. And now we're going to continue.
Picking up where we left off now, we're in Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now it's interesting to note, an angel of the Lord said to Philip. There are places in the scripture where it says the Holy Spirit said. There are places in the scripture where uh, prophecy comes forth and it's identified as prophecy. And, you know, like Timothy told by Paul, but the prophecies you received through me, he said, I spoke the word of the Lord to you. So we know that happens. But here we see an angel, which is angelos or messenger, a messenger of the Lord said to Philip. And we don't know what this is. And it could be just another term and another way of saying the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the comfort of the one sent to be with us, to console, to teach, to lead, to guide, to direct us, to tell us the will of the Father, to remind us of all the principles of Jesus. So he's a very good messenger of the truths of the kingdom. But this could have been an actual angel. And I believe that as the church matures in these last days, I believe that that we're going to start to have encounters with an angels. There's going to be angelic appearances. I mean, we have the Holy Spirit. I, I love the Holy Spirit. And I want the Holy Spirit all the time. But sometimes it's the, the, the voice of the Spirit to us is a little elusive. And as powerful as they have the anointing, I mean, they had it fresh. You know, you would think, and I don't really believe this, but I'm going to speculate and say that, you know, the first draft is the cleanest product because they, they are right at the time the Holy Spirit came to earth. So it seems like they would have a really pristine form of the outpour. And I don't really believe that. I believe it's exactly the same today as it was then. But I'm just saying, with that idea in mind, you would think that they are so sensitive to the Holy Spirit that they wouldn't need anything but the Holy Spirit. But here an angel is employed. An angel. And I think it would really be um, a little easier to make a serious life change and walk away from everything you know to be real, walk away from an ongoing revival as an evangelist. You understand Philip is in the middle of what he dreamed a whole community is getting saved. The whole town is being filled with the Holy Spirit. What greater place would you want as a minister of the gospel than to stand and preside over an outpouring of the Spirit that's so great that the whole nation, the whole area, everyone you know in the area is coming to Jesus. And even if the Holy Spirit told him at that point, leave this, he probably wouldn't listen to that. That's why I think it took an angel. I know that if I'm in the middle of a revival, in fact, I was in Mexico, we're in the middle of a revival, it was very hard for, for me to leave that. It took a lot of wrestling. It took God showing me things and then preparing me and bringing me to India and me telling him I can't go to India. And, you know, the argument, you know, the story, all that argument, it took a lot. An angel didn't come to me because I ultimately did yield to the Holy Spirit. But there's a lot less room for a fight if an angel walks in. An angel, just just guy, walks in. And of course, don't picture the wings like Hollywood. But an angel, this guy that you know, that speaks to you. And so this is what it took to pry Philip out of that ongoing revival. And the angel said, go south to the road. The desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, notice that it doesn't say anything about what he's going to do. It just says, go. Go. And there's so many of us that won't do something unless we have a guarantee of something great taking place. There's so many of us that start to do something and quit doing it because we don't see the reward that we thought we should have. We had our little dreams about, okay, if I serve God in this capacity, then this will happen within this many months. And I have fallen victim to that scenario a hundred times. I always have ideas. And as far as I'm concerned, we should not still be in this bomb shelter. Because of what God is doing in our midst, we should be in the Colosseum somewhere. We should be in a stadium. And there should be tens of thousands of people. I mean, that's the kind of anointing that's flowing. It, is a, it could be amazing. But for whatever reason, 
God makes the choices and decisions about how he wants to do what he wants to do. So we are relegated to a subservient position as subjects to the king. We don't, we don't ask why. You know, like the proverbial pot telling the potter, why have you made me like this? We can't do that. We just let the Lord do this. So Philip was not given any promise. He just said, go south to the desert road. Not the city road or the shopping mall, but the desert road. It goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Some very important words here where it says, on his way way. Most of the time when God calls you to do something, He gives you a direction. He does not tell you what's going to happen. You have a destination in mind. This is not the first time Philip is traveling these areas. He knows what's where. If he hadn't been himself, then he certainly knows there were maps that did have maps drawn. They, he knew. So he, in his head, I'm sure he had a destination. Go south on the road. Okay, it's a road that goes to a certain destination. We know that to be Gaza. So I'm sure in his head he thought he was going to Gaza. I can't tell you how many ministries and how many miraculous things I saw and have seen take place both in my own life and in other people's lives that are on the way to something. And it becomes so successful, something that happens on the way that the destination gets forgotten. And they do that thing. Most ministries that are really worth their salt, that's how they start. They plan something, but then this happened. A lot of times people are so, so focused on that goal. Now what if he decided God called me to Gaza? God didn't really call him to Gaza. God said go on the road that leads to Gaza. But what if he decided? And then this Ethiopian that he met along the way was just an obstacle to be pushed out of, the, out of the way. But it didn't. He was subject to the Lord. In fact, you're going to see in the book of Acts a whole bunch of divine encounters. In fact, from here on out, it's just divine encounter after divine encounter after divine encounter. Divine appointment made by not man, but by God. And everybody simply trying to keep up with what God has planned. Not knowing not being able to predict what's going to take place. That's exactly why Jesus said it's like the wind. If you want to live by the Spirit, this is what happens. You're told by an angel to go on the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. You think you're going to Gaza, and you start out, and on your way you meet an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official. This is a divine appointment. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So this man went to Jerusalem to worship, which means he was a devotee or a proselyte or a follower of Jehovah God. And the reason I know this already is because he has scrolls from the Holy Scriptures. He's not there to worship another God. He's there to worship God. And so he's on a, a, a fact-finding, devotional, religious trip. And in the middle of that, um, on his way home, he was sitting in his chair reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit told Philip. Now we see an angel told Philip here. And now the Spirit's telling Philip. It's a little easier for the Holy Spirit to direct us once we are in motion. But when we're in a place that's hard to get us out of and we're comfortable, it takes something to pry us out of there. And then once we're there, then the Holy Spirit can only lead someone who is flexible and, and can be easily directed. So the Spirit tells Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. That's kind of an obscure uh, request. That'd be like saying, go over by that car in the park, in the car park out here. That, see that Isuzu over there? Go by that blue Isuzu and just stand over there. By. What did the Lord tell you to do that? I've actually done stuff like this. And just go, you just feel like, I don't know why, and you feel like an idiot, because you're like, who goes and just stands? You know people looking at you like you're trying to break into the car or you're doing something dishonest or but I've had that I've had the Lord give me impulse. I've been in my apartment before and suddenly just this feeling like I don't know, just just shaky nervousness and I've gone outside and went downstairs and just went and stood outside and felt like I just need to be here. 
and don't know why, and then all of a sudden somebody comes walking by. One time in, in Mexico, the Lord told me, I was praying, the Lord said, there was this car that I had. And the car, we were legalizing it in Mexico, but some things happened because of the way it was being legalized that were not good, and I was about to get into a lot of trouble with the government. I didn't know this until after, but the Lord was speaking to me, and I had this little car. I'm trying to, it was a Volkswagen Jetta. It was a nice little car. I was trying to register it, get it set up there, and, and the Lord told me, give that car away. He says, you need to give that car to this person. His name was Antonio. And I said, okay. And the Lord, and I said, okay. And the Lord said, now. I said, what do you mean now? He said, now, now, now. And I caught up, and I, I didn't know what was happening, but I went to my door in a community of thousands of people, and as I opened my door and stepped out, Antonio was one meter away from me, walking down, just like that. And he said, hey, I said, hey. I said, look, I need to give you my most like angel. And he just <laughs> looked at me funny, but one thing led to another. It was just a divine appointment for him as much as it was for me. It got me out of trouble. It counted for me as, a, as an offering, so the Lord rewarded me for it. It wasn't a loss in God's economy. But these are strange things that happen, that God can direct us and tell us to do things. And the Spirit tells us. The Spirit told Philip, go to the chariot. Stay near. Now, it continues. Then Philip ran up to the chariot. He didn't say run to the chariot. He said just go up to the chariot. But apparently the chariot was in, in motion. <laughs> you understand? So now this complicates the issue a little bit. Now not only is he strange, he's a lunatic because he's running next to the vehicle. And then we'll go back to the Blue Isuzu trip where the Lord's told you to go stand by it, but on your way over to see it, somebody gets in it and starts up and is driving it away. <laughs> Most would say at that moment, oh, it must not be God. I just, you know, opportunity's lost. See you later. <laughs> but what would happen if you ran after the Isuzu and you got next to it and you're running down the, over here towards Street 22, you know, you're running down the thing, waving at the window or in the car at the people there. This is exactly what Philip's doing. Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. That means he was close enough to hear over the rumbling sound of the wheels of a chariot on a, a dusty road, a desert road. You know, it was making noise. The horses clip clop, clip clop, clip clop, and so he's reading. That means he is right next to the man listening to him read. And so he hears him. He says, uh, Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asks. <laughs> you understand? Philip's not in the chair yet. Philip's still. <laughs> hey, you understand that? <laughs> he's still going along, and so now. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Obviously, he stopped the chariot at this point and said, come on. So Philip gets up in the chariot, and here he read something that was perplexing to him that he could not understand. He needed someone to explain a spiritual thing to him. That this is one of the, the telltale ingredients of a divine appointment. Uh, we had kind of a divine appointment with uh, the brother who came in here on Sunday night. At the, after the meeting, after everything. It was uh, the brother-in-law of our sister that comes here to the meetings. And uh, she's not here right now. But when he was standing back there and we were talking, I, we just connected. He needed to hear what I had to say. And I, I needed to talk to him. And, and it was a divine appointment. We talked and talked and talked. I felt kind of sorry for the man because at the end he was like, I've been looking for you all my life. And now I have to go. Because that's a divine appointment. You feel you have questions that cannot be answered. But the person who God sends has the answers and they come out one after the other, after the other, after the other. This is what happened with me and Rodney Harm Brown. I had all kinds of questions I could not answer, and no preacher, no teacher, no minister out there, no, not Kenneth Hagin, not Benny Hinn, not Joyce Myers, not Marilyn Hickey, nobody really, I mean, they would say great things, not even my Bible school teacher or my pastor, none of them really, it was interesting, but I still had these questions 
And I remember the first time that I heard Rodney Hardbrand speak, I kept on saying, right, right. I mean, not amen. I learned that day what amen means. We say amen religiously, but he was saying things that resonated so deeply inside of me and answered questions that I carried for more than a decade that I knew were the answers but were confirmed by his preaching. I would literally say, thank you, yes. In the middle of the preaching, I would say that. And other people would say, hey, amen, no, not me. I was like, that's, that's, see, that's what I'm talking about. The man is finally saying Thank you for finally saying it. It just, there was a connection. And you see this in divine appointments. I see, that's how I know who I'm supposed to connect to and who I'm not supposed to connect to. People come, hear me speak, hear me teach when the anointing's upon me to speak by the Spirit. And they either think that's all crazy or it just makes perfect sense. I have so many people come after meetings here when they come for the first time and later, you know, you, you just said so many, this message was for me. They go on, they felt. That doesn't mean that they're going to obey the Lord because most of them go and leave and never come back. But the connection was made. Most people are like the rich young ruler. The connection is there. They, 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 they are hungry, they're interested, but when the price comes of what it takes to truly grow in the kingdom and be discipled, they're not willing to pay that price, so they back off. So he knows, how can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading the passage of Scripture where it says that he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Now this is interesting. That particular passage. He's read this and he's wondering, who is this? Who's this person? This passage is touching my heart. Now this is before Philip even got there. He read this and was meditating on it. Wanting to know inside, who is this person? Who's it talking about? Tell me, please, the eunuch asked Philip, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Because the eternity in his heart that God put in there was for him to know Jesus. And in every person, inherently, eternally, is a desire to know the one. They don't always figure out who that is. Sometimes, even when you tell them who it is, they don't accept it, but it's inside. This man felt it. These words burned in his heart. He knew there's got to be something. I'm not, I, this is how I got saved. I knew I needed to know something. There was a person I needed to connect to. And, and when I first out of desperation looked in the skies, if you're real, I wasn't speaking to a cloud. I was speaking to a person I didn't know yet. But I, I needed to know my best friend I never knew. That's the feeling. Someone out there that I, I, this, I've got to connect. It's like having a lover for, for years and then losing that lover in a tragedy. That feeling of loss rode in me for years before I met Jesus. And that's what the eunuch is feeling as he's reading this passage. This passage just pointed to something that already existed in his heart. And God sets people up like this. There are people, countless thousands of people right here in Singapore that are this eunuch, that are in the place of wanting to know and have felt the need to identify with the, this person and they need someone to explain it to them. They're waiting for someone to be crazy enough to run next to a chariot, chase it down and wave and talk to them, communicate, do you even know what you're reading? Do you understand that? Go through an embarrassing circumstance to cross the line and speak to them. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. I wish they had given us the words of his reply. I would like to have studied his after he heard this. Take the scroll out of his hand and 
and say, oh, this passage, this is a good one. You see, and start explaining, you're in luck, man. You, this is really amazing. I happen to be a representative of the guy who this is talking about. And you can imagine the eunuch at that point was, really? Yep. This guy, this is, see, this is the Messiah. And then he was able to tell him the story about Jesus and what Jesus did and everything coming clear and it made perfect sense to them. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? You think, well, how, how would he even know to be baptized? Because that was part of the presentation. He told him everything. He explained along that trip for a while. He told him, this is what we do. We get saved. We get water baptized. We get baptized in the Holy Spirit. We go to heaven. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you're going to have to, Jesus is preparing a place where he said you don't have to worry. If it were not true, he would tell us. But he has a place in his father's house. And, and he's telling him all these things. So the Ethiopian now knows, okay, he's thinking wisely, okay, I need to accept Jesus. Well, that's easy. I need to be water baptized. And as he's listening intently, he sees water. Fortuitously, there's a body of water in the desert. <laughs> They're on a desert road, but somehow they're coming across this water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again. He went on his way rejoicing. But what a day in the life of the eunuch. This eunuch had an amazing testimony. I would like to sit in the church where the eunuch of Candace has come to share his testimony. Just to hear the story from his perspective. If some of you are so inclined and you are artistic and skilled in writing, I challenge you to write a book from the perspective of the Ethiopian about uh, the eunuch, how he got saved. Wouldn't it be an interesting novel to read? Like, kind of, you'd have to use some artistic license, but that always fascinates. He told the story of, of in fact, that would be a really cool drama. Dressed like an Ethiopian eunuch, come in the church and stand in front of her and tell the story dramatically about how I got saved. Introduce yourself. Wouldn't it be a cool drama? I think that's the word of the Lord for somebody to develop that and do that. Or for me to develop it. And do that. <laughs> I think it's more work, right? <laughs> so he gave us, but both Philip and the eunuch went down to baptize, and this, he just, as he come up out of the water, He's looking at Philip, and Philip <laughs> vanishes in thin air right before him. Just, that's a sign and a wonder. Remember what we saw with the miracles of the signs and the wonders to authenticate the word preached. The eunuch heard this whole message, the whole presentation. He went through the steps through believing, confessing, I believe, water baptism, and just as he's coming out of that, he disappears right in front of him. He knows this is not a stupid man. He knows that guy just vanished. This is a miracle. That's why he was rejoicing. Nothing could shake the belief of this man at this point. Because he saw a miracle. And that's how the Lord seals. In fact, the miraculous will only flow through someone willing to be an idiot for Jesus. To do something crazy. In fact, that's the only time you see something really amazing happen is when people take chances and, and step out on the limb, so to speak. Walking in the Spirit, I say all the time, it's like, it's like being out on a limb. Do you ever hear that experience? Or that um, that's, people say, he's out on a limb, meaning that it's dangerous, the limb could crack. And I always said, you know, living for Jesus, it's like being out on a limb and you hear the limb cracking all the time. And when you finally get some stability, you hear a sawing sound. <laughs> and you look at the tree's main bark, and you're on the branch, and there's Jesus smiling with a saw. <laughs> That's life in the spirit. You don't understand. Why are you cutting my limb? 
And Jesus knows that the, what you need is that limb to be cut because he's got even greater things for you. But it's never going to make sense to you. Every time I get nervous when I'm when I gain stability in my life, I get scared. It used to be the other way around. When I lost stability, I would, you know, I would be frightened. Now when things stabilize in my life, I'm nervous. Uh-oh. Because I know something's about to break loose. Because in 30 years of doing what I do, that's the way it works. That stability is short-lived. It comes a little while, but then there's Jesus. <laughs> And then Philip, whoosh, disappears. Let's go to the next slide. Philip going to Caesarea. Now, Philip, however, appeared at Asotas. Who was there at Asotas when this happened? Was it like in a crowd? Was it in a, behind a tree at least? Did God like try to do this in a way that it didn't disturb people? Or did God want to draw attention? He is an evangelist. That'd be interesting. Was it in a prayer meeting where they had church and all of a sudden <laughs> there's Philip? Oh! Where's the eunuch? And they're like, what eunuch? I, I, never mind. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus to start doing an evangelist thing, you know. Preach the gospel. But he appeared at Azotas and traveled about preaching the gospel. I wouldn't be surprised that he had an audience because he just just appear out of thin air. That would definitely get some attention. Probably put, put him on a stage like at Plaza Singapore down at the bottom floor, you know, where the stage is. Just everybody's gathered there and all of a sudden, <laughs> they would want to hear, I would want to hear what that guy has to say. Suddenly he appeared out of thin air. I'd be interested to hear what has to be said. And so he went out preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. They went to Caesarea, uh, but now the original, because, by the way, this is a really far distance. This is miles and miles and miles and miles away for him to be translated, as it were, from one place to another. I've always wanted this to happen in my ministry. Uh, we, we lived in Mexico. We did a lot of traveling. Uh, we regularly ministered between Monterey and Monclova, Monterey and Torreón. We would go to as far as Zacatecas. And these, we're talking, you know, 10-hour drives. A short drive in our ministry back then was like three or four. Four hours was like next door. Next door. And so some of those longer trips, I would all, this, I would be thinking, meditating on the scripture all. I'd be praying, God. My back would be hurting. My legs hurt from working the clutch and driving through traffic. And tra India even more so. In India, we had a Tuesday, and every Tuesday, Ulas and I got a trip that would take us three and a half to four hours from, from IC Colony to get out there. And that was like an eight hour round trip every week we had to make. And plus all the other meetings. And I often prayed for translation. <laughs> just take me on. Take it. What would be the harm in you just making me and the whole vehicle? I was specific too. It's not just me. And leave my vehicle. <laughs> There, I want to, me, the vehicle, everybody in it. Don't leave some of the people there. I was really specific. I was probably way too specific for God about that miracle, so he just never took me up on it. But I would have loved to have seen that. So now he goes and he's traveling and he's in Caesarea. Now we're going to start. We're going to move into the conversion of Saul. Here comes Saul of Tarsus. Paul sees the Lord. We begin in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Now what you know about this guy is said in this first verse. Meanwhile, Saul still was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So here is the breather of threats that are murderous that is threatening to kill. Murderous means to murder I mean, kill. He's wanting to kill. He said, I'm going to kill you. So he's breathing out the words, you're going to die. That was his job. To yell murderous threats out to anyone that followed Jesus. Not the kind of guy you want to run into as a believer. Bad guy. Bad guy. It gets no worse. 
No worse than this. He was worse than the Pharisees. Well, he was a Pharisee, but he was worse than the Pharisees in the day of Jesus because he was far more empowered. He had a lot more authority at this point. He, he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters, documents. These are uh, court documents, edicts declaring that, that he could go to the synagogues in Damascus uh, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, this is pre-Antioch, so there's no term Christian yet. They just said those of the way, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem for their ultimate execution. That was what he wanted to do. They were going to get a trial. In other words, they were going to be brought to a place where they were interrogated and questioned and pressured to deny Christ. Imagine the worst. That's what was going on. Torture, beating, whatever you want. De uh, food deprivation, water deprivation, locked in cells, being tormented as long as possible to get them to renege and let go of this belief in the way that is Jesus. He called himself the way, the truth, and the life. Probably why they use the term. It's the same word in the Greek. So they said, we are of the way. He's the only way. And so... There's this Paul. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you were persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city. And you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink any of them. Three days. Without seeing, as I say all the time, jokingly, but, you know, he had been such a bad boy that God punished him and put him in a room and said, now think about what you've done. And locked him away for three days in darkness to think about it. He got straightened out. Jesus came. The light shined. Struck him blind. And said to him, Saul, Saul, Man, why are you bothering me? Well, who are you, Lord, that I'd be bothering you? He said, I'm Jesus, the guy that you are saying that you cannot believe in. What a, uh, <laughs> what a complete transformation. The guy who he could see at up this point, you have to consider. Saul so believed. I believe he was a man of absolute integrity. I think that's why he was killing the Christians. Because he was so zealous for God and so in love with God and the principles of his, the nation of Israel and the laws of Moses that he memorized by the age of five when he was just a child that he carried his whole life that, that this was the biggest shock of his life. To find out that he was hurting the one he loved more than anyone else. And then to be blinded and put somewhere for three days, three days to think about. I'm sure for those three days, he went back one by one to every person in his mind that he persecuted and hurt who were in allegiance to this Jesus who has come to him. Straightened him out, and he probably was in remorseful prayer and anguish for those three days. One by one, naming. He was a court official, so he knew the names as much as a lawyer knows the names of the people they are prosecuting. They know who they are coming against. And that's He knew the names of every single one of the people that he tried and found and even murdered and probably was screaming and lying prostrate, begging for forgiveness for three days. We don't think often about what he was doing at that time, but I know that this is what he was doing. He was repenting, begging for mercy. Have mercy on me. I'm sorry for, for what has happened. Three days. Now, the story continues. 
Ananias ministers to Paul. Now Paul's in that room, third day, still there, by himself, he's put there. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In the vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered. I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. I mean, you know this guy's picture was posted in, in the church house. The, you know that, that they all feared, this was the most feared person in the community. It'd be like the head of Al-Qaeda and I'm working in, in Yemen as a missionary. <laughs> And, and here the, the head of Al-Qaeda found out where I am. Should I be afraid of that guy? Of course I should be afraid. He's coming to extinguish an American missionary in Yemen, preaching the gospel. says that I'm walking death sentence. And so this is what Ananias is thinking. This is the guy. I've heard about this guy. I watched a special report on Fox News. This is the guy. This is the one empowered by the law to kill us. Are you sure, Lord? <laughs> so he says it. I, I knew all about him. He came to, 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 to harm us and to hurt your saints in Jerusalem. He's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Jesus. <laughs> He's arguing with you. I thought you loved me. <laughs> but the Lord said to Ananias, Go. <laughs> the consolation of the Lord, go. <laughs> I know exactly what this is like. I, I, have, I have been in this position, to, maybe not as extreme as Ananias, but I've been in the position to go and was told to go to a place where I knew I was going to be arrested. The promise was there. The threats came from the local community in Indonesia where I was going to preach and have a crusade. And they said, we will arrest him. We know he's coming. We have his name, because they put my name on a big banner. They, we have his name. <laughs> and we are going to arrest him. That's the report I got from the pastor in Indonesia. They told me, delay your trip, don't come. And when he told me this, the Lord said, go. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I felt like, oh, but they said that you know, there's a, they're going to arrest me, Lord. And he, go. <laughs> Not like, don't worry, I'm going to work it out. Everything's going to be okay, my son, my precious little lamb. Come, I will caress and hold you and comfort you so you don't have any worries. I'm going to work out. No, he just said, go. And I had to go. And I, I, remember I kissed my wife goodbye. We hugged. We cried together. Uh, I got in the taxi. I went to the, to the ferry dock. I got on the boat. It was like stepping into a time warp. Time slowed down that boat ride. <laughs> thinking the whole way about prison and the things that happen to people in prison and what's going to happen to me and at least I can preach the gospel and because God said to go, I had to go. And of course, uh, the, the little miracle happened on the way there. In the time it took me in that one hour boat trip on my way to the shores of Indonesia, uh, uh, a Muslim man in the community of Indonesia heard from the police that I was going to be arrested and then he found out where he was disturbed about this and wondered I guess he could have thinking, thought of it from many perspectives maybe from a business perspective that bad publicity bad press American arrested for doing a charity thing you know I don't know what went through his head but whatever it was it was planted there by Almighty God and it was so it so bothered him that he investigated found out where the meeting was going to be and turned out that the meeting was going to be on his property, on his shopping complex. He had a shopping mall, a big complex with all the shops. And it was on his property. He called his lawyer 
and said, look, here's the problem. This guy's going to be arrested. Um, the law is the law, and they're going to honor the law. Can you look into this? He got his lawyer on retainer to check and find out was there any way that we could get around this? Because now even the word come that Stephen's coming anyway. Because I told the pastor, I have to go to Lord Tommy and the pastor was scared. No, we can't have the meeting. I said, we have to have the meeting. That he's scared, I'm scared. We don't know anything about what's happening behind the scenes that the Lord is doing. And the lawyer found out that the law written said that I could not preach the gospel on public property. And so he checked the domain and the name of his region in that thing and, and registered it in court and found out that it was part of, a, of, of an own parcel of land that was in fact not public but was his because he owned it in the shopping complex it. so he had he had statements and affidavits written up by his lawyers and sealed by judges there all this is all happening within like an hour and a half while I'm on my way to my death sentence. All this happens and it's a document, a court document saying and declaring the property as private property thereby nullifying the law that they could arrest me and I could preach on private property because it was the same as preaching in somebody's house. And when I got there, the pastor ran up to me all happy. I don't know about the good news. I just know that why are you happy? <laughs> why are you smiling? He's like, Jesus, God did a miracle, and he told me. And sure enough, we did. We had the meeting. Uh, God was there. The power of God was there. People got saved, received Jesus as their Savior, and we had a great time. Supernatural. So in a, in a small way, I understand what Ananias is going through. He, why would he have to do this? But the Lord said, go. And he tells him, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings, and before the people of Israel, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. We're going to stay right here. Go back. Um, I will show him how much we, he must suffer for my name. So this is what Ananias knows. Ananias is told to go and speak to him that he's the chosen vessel. That means that that our judge judgment of the character of people is not the judgment we should depend upon when it comes to the presentation of the gospel and the work that we do. Never look at someone and think they're never going to get saved. That you, you would have thought there's no way. The least likely person to be a Christian was Saul of Tarsus. And that's the very person who became probably the best Christian we've ever seen to do wonderful things. You don't know. There's people in your family. There's friends. There's neighbors you think are full of hate. And they are. You think that they're, they're ornery and they're reprobates. And they may be. You think that they're totally resistant. And they could be. But don't discount them. Because God is the God of impossibilities become impossible. You just need to yield to Him. Listen to what He says. He'll work it out. When He tells you to talk to these people. Just, just rest and know. If he says it, just do it. Just do it. It's worth the risk because you never know what's going to happen. There are people that are the chosen instrument of God to carry out my name. I was cruel to Christians before I got saved. I was a drug dealer, so I was on the streets all the time, walking up and down the streets, and the Christians would be out there witnessing. I would never listen to them, but I would, I would just belittle them and make fun of them and then I would misdirect them and tell, I would like you mess around with my friends and I would say, you need to talk to him. He says he, he wants to do the church thing and, and they would go and my friend would be like, shut up, man. And we would like just mess with him. We'd make fun of him and mock him all the time. We never really thought about it. I was, I was not very likely to be the one getting saved. But I got saved. Because God came and found me. So you never know what's going to happen. Amen? We left off with Ananias being told to go and be friendly with the the murderous threat breather <laughs> who has vowed <laughs> to destroy and arrest and persecute every believer in the Lord Jesus. Thereby Jesus tells Ananias, Ananias, do me a favor. Go talk to the murderer. And Ananias, of course, argued, as we all would in that case, but ultimately the Lord has just told Ananias that this man, I've chosen him. 
And so he's a vessel of mine, an instrument to reach the nations. As we continue in verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. <laughs> what else are you going to do? I mean, if God told you to do it, you have to do it. That's why I always ask people when they talk about, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. What did God tell you to do? If God tells you to go see Saul of Tarsus and pray for him, then you have to go see Saul of Tarsus and pray for him. And if you get in the habit of not doing what God told you to do, then God's going to stop asking you to do things. Stop talking to you. So you're no longer in communication with God. You end up in that group of Christians who comes and complains because God never talks to me. I hear you talk about how the Lord said this and the Lord said that. You know, I never hear His voice. Oh, yeah, you do. You did anyway. Years ago, He did talk to you, but you didn't do what He told you to do. So He's waiting for you to obey. Well, what do I have to do? What did God tell you? Go back. You can run as far as you want in the opposite direction, but you're still going to have to go to Nineveh. So come back, wipe off the vomit, get off the beach, and come and do what God calls you to do. So anyway, Ananias, of course, did, did what the Lord said to do to begin with. He went to the house, he entered it, placing his hands on Saul. <laughs> and you get the picture. You know, did he have still some ideas about him? When he placed his hands on him, was he first reaching for his neck and then he <laughs> switched to a prayer mode after? <laughs> I tell you the History Channel apparently has come up with a Bible uh, docudrama. It looks really good. I'm interested to see how that scenario works out. <laughs> so he plays his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, he's calling him brother. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, which would have been enough to open his eyes to the sense, well, no pun intended, but enough to show him that, that he knew something and was connected to the one that met him on the road. God will do that, by the way, for us to know who to connect to and who to receive from. They will seem to know things that only God knows. And that is part of the connection of a divine appointment. Because remember, we just saw a divine appointment with, with um, Philip and the eunuch. Now we see a divine appointment with Ananias and Saul. These are people that do not know each other, never met each other, but God knows both of them and have some business to accomplish that cannot happen unless these people come together. There has to be people with people for the kingdom to advance. There has to be a laying on of hands. There has to be prayer in this form. Um, it doesn't say that Philip laid hands on the eunuch, but you know he did. Because that's the when he water baptizing, he didn't stand on the shore and watch him out in the water. Okay, now lower down. No, he he had his hands on him. <laughs> Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. It's interesting to say that something like scales because they're, you know, you've heard of cataracts and these certain diseases. It's like almost a shell will form over the eye, affecting vision and obscuring vision. And it covers, it may cover the cornea or the lens itself, may, may get cloudy. This happens with people. There's a lot of surgeries now that can do this. But if if something was put over his eyes, on his eyes, almost like a contact lens, if a contact lens falls out of your eye, doesn't it look like a fish scale? It looks like a scale. And so this was something that formed, maybe from the bright light, that the actual radiant heat of God shined into his eyes and burnt the surface of the eye itself. And I'm looking at it from a practical standpoint. And so healing was simply those things getting broken off and falling off of his eyeballs as what appear to be scales. You know, I mean, it's interesting for us to talk about because it's written here. Why does it even have to mention it if it wasn't something that we should talk about? It says, it's like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Because for three days, you know, one of the most um, stressful moments of your life is when you have been punished. Uh, another stressful factor is that you're blind. 
than you weren't before. He went through a lot of stress. He did not eat for those three days. And so he was obviously very weak. But being baptized and taking some food and eating, he regains his strength. And now, in essence, Ananias has somebody to, to help, and he has to connect him to the body of Christ. So Saul, in verse 19, we're at number 3, under this heading, Paul proclaims Jesus as the Christ. Verse 19, the second half of that verse, we cut verse 19 in half between these two sections. We're going to go down to verse 30 as we proceed. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Now, several days would mean seven days, but it could be more or less. At least a week he spent doing what? Listening and learning from the Disciples. These are people who were of the way, people who believed in Jesus. Ananias was one of them, but as well as others. I picture Saul. Now, he's a very humble man at this point, and he's taken by the hand by Ananias. He said, Come with me. I want you to meet some people. And he meets the people in the church. Now, what did he feel like walking into a combined group? knowing that the last time he did that, he did it to arrest those people. And now he's going, the very people he needs at this point in his life more than ever before are the ones he's persecuted. He really, really went through some mind issues uh, to become, that's why when I teach on missions, I teach three motivations for missions, and I talk about the Apostle Paul, and one of those motivations is guilt. You know, I do missions because of guilt. You know, I'm, I have really something burning in my heart for North Korea. I can't put it down. It's haunting me, coming after I don't know, I know that's ridiculous. How in the world could I ever affect North Korea? But I've got something I have to do for North Korea. And, and it has, it, it connects to some things that I saw the Lord showed me in uh, a child in North Korea that had no parents. And when I saw that child starving with no parents and they asked her, this is all in Korean, and sometimes you can read, they asked her, this is all taken on the roadways in North Korea, this little girl who looked like a zombie. She looked like something from a movie, like a zombie. Uh, sunken eyes and just, you know, walking aimlessly, just wandering. They asked her where she was from. And, um, she, she named the, the region and uh, where's her mom she's dead where's your dad she's dead oh he's dead and she was the only one left in her family and she looked like a skeleton just walking death and I thought gosh you know what what's what the the torment there I mean I've been studying a lot reading a lot going through a lot about it I don't know why I don't know why uh, obviously the Lord directs us Saul spent several days with the disciples. He's learning his feelings, uh, the guilt. But anyway, that's where I was getting at. The point was the guilt to see that little girl and then see my little girl. And the Lord uses stuff like that. And I said, my little girl's biggest worry is, is, um, is how many My Little Ponies she has. <laughs> and are their tails combed properly? Or, you know, this is seriously. These are, when she comes crying about something, it's because there's tangles in a pony's tail. Or, and I fix that problem as if it were the end of the world, you know, because it's my little girl. And here's this little girl starving. And I feel guilty when I see her. And there's nothing wrong with those feelings. You know, we need to allow those feelings to help us to make a difference in people's lives. And we are doing a lot, but there's more that can be done. So all those who heard him were astonished. Because why? Because at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. What a, what a turnaround. Because Jesus met him and told him, hey, it's me, Jesus. So now he's these seven days, he's getting ready. And immediately, at once, he began, as soon as he had opportunity, and they asked him, how did you get here? He's telling them, Jesus met me. I was on the road to Damascus. There goes that story. This is the first time at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, hey, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? They're confused at how this person could be absolutely radically changed. Well, I can tell you how, because of God's power. The power of God. When a man truly has a, 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 a collision with the power of God, it changes everything. 
to me, this just changes the way you think. <laughs> All it takes is the light of heaven. When, when, if, 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 he, if, if, if he can just shine a light on a guy, doesn't matter. That's what, you know, you need to really think about this, and you need to pray for your families. God, strike them with heaven's light. Just let beams of heaven come down into there. Let it be like that meteor coming into the atmosphere in Russia. Just let a ball of fire come down into people's lives. Shake them. Turn them around. Open their eyes. Let them see Jesus, know Jesus, and turn into the greatest preachers of Jesus that the world has ever seen. Save the most the most resistant, the most hard-hearted of our family members and people in Singapore. Lord, at the highest tiers of authority in religious groups here in Singapore, shine the light of God on the highest ranking officials of groups that do not believe in Jesus. Visit them supernaturally on their road to Damascus and show them. Come to them and say, I Jesus and show them truth so that they like Saul can become Paul and that we have the best preachers and teachers of the faith in Singapore being people who were the most uh, most adamant enemies of the faith. Lord, you can do it. There's nothing impossible for you. I believe that the, the only difference between Saul and Paul was a ray of heaven's light. That's it. The only difference between Saul and Paul was light. The light of God shined on him, blinded him, and then he was healed and his eyes were opened to a whole new perspective. That can happen to any man. Any man that has that kind of encounter, that they're going to have to do something. They're going to have to open up. God can do it. God is doing it in parts of Indonesia. God's doing it and in, in, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. You ever hear uh, Bush LeBeau's story about the guy, he was talking hardened criminal. Everybody knew this guy. The least likely guy to ever get saved in his community there in Brulee, Addis area. Um, uh, I won't mention his name because I don't know that he would want me to, but this guy me, everybody knew, stay away from that guy. He's a bad guy in the community. And you know, drinker, brawler, fighter and he always in jail in and out. Everything bad that you can be, he was it. And, and uh, Pastor Butch was talking to him. And he sat in a pickup truck with him. He was sitting next to him telling him about Jesus, how he needed Jesus. This guy had no interest in all. And as he's telling him, Butch said, out of the corner of his eye, he saw behind the truck um, what he thought was a vehicle pulling in behind them like a car. And he said the light came like, you know, he didn't even pay attention to it because it looked like an automobile pulling in with the headlights shining in. He said, but the, but the light kept coming and kept coming. He said, by the time he looked up, he said it was a ball of light that came into the truck and hit the man. A ball, a big bright ball of light. It struck both of them. And the man, of course, he had no, there was no denying that ball of light hit him. The man immediately received Jesus as he said <laughs> Immediately got saved today is sitting on the front row of Butcher's Church. And just a miracle, absolute miracle. So don't tell me it can't happen. It's happening today. So it can happen to our family members. It can happen to people right here in the community. The book of Acts is not a historical book of legends of the past. As we set out to look and discover this book as a template for the now, as a manual, an operator's manual for the church of Jesus on earth today. That means this is in our arsenal of weapons against the enemy. The, the light beam. So we can call on God to shine the beam of heaven's light on the people that surround us. Amen? So we agree it's going to happen. Now we continue. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. And because he had this amazing education as a disciple of Gamaliel, he knew the law inside and out. So he could take all the Messianic prophecies and line them up and prove without a doubt that they all pointed to Jesus as the Messiah. 
and was doing so perfectly, breaking this down and baffling the people who tried to refute his point of view. Couldn't. I'm sure I would like to have been there in some of the debates to listen to this master, now empowered by the Holy Spirit, coupling with all that vast education and knowledge he has of the law and the word, now the Holy Spirit is helping him. They're ganging up on the enemies, Paul and the Holy Spirit. So now they're working in tandem and Paul's saying something from knowledge and the Holy Spirit is giving him the next passage. He said, tell him this, tell him this. Hey, and, and he's telling him, and I would love to have been there in the room where they were baffled. Because they would say, but do you know that the law says it? But oh, don't give me that because it says here and this and that. And, and they were quiet. They didn't have anything that they could say against what he was saying. Because he was proving, proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. Because that's what you do with somebody you can't shut up. You kill them. If they're stronger, smarter, and better, and more powerful than you are, and that there's no way that you can win against them by normal means of logic and discussion and civility, kill them. And, and believe me, still to this day, this is the answer to the problems of a lot of people in religious circles. That's what they end up doing. They just, you know, they couldn't, they could not fight against Cesar Castellanos in Bogotá, Colombia. They couldn't, his church was growing thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. All the peasants were getting saved because of their evangelists. The people who were growing the cocaine were giving their hearts to Jesus and refusing to grow it any longer. The drug lords were losing business because such massive revival swept through all of Colombia that they decided we just have to kill him. And they did. They put hits out on his life and they filled him full of bullets with machine guns at a traffic stop on motorcycles. They pulled up and just filled it. He was, whole body was filled with bullets. The doctors had no idea. All of his blood left his body and he still stayed alive. They brought him to the hospital and he, he survived. Survived. This is the, you know, you hear G12, this is where it came from, from this, this guy. And, you know, I don't know him, I know his, 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 uh, his associate, his right-hand man um, uh, I met and spent time with here in Singapore. And I heard the story in detail about how it happened. But, so that's still an answer, but they, it didn't work on the so they, they got in the hospital, he got healed. He had to leave the country, they had to flee, but then his ministry became even more powerful outside of the country. And he preached and taught and, and uh, healed up. He still has some of the bullets in his body. They couldn't even pull them out. They had to leave them in there. Are you suffering for Jesus? I don't think to that extent. But his, you know, his story would make a really good movie. So anyway, they, they conspired to kill Saul. But Saul learned of their plan. I'm sure he was expecting it to begin with. Because that was his job before. So now he knows, he knows the way they operate. Which makes it even more dangerous. Because he knows exactly, it'd be like a CIA agent turning on the CIA. Or just recently, there was an, a police officer in the United States who turned on the police force, the LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department, and they, they couldn't get the guy. The guy kept escaping and running. Because why? Because he had every, everything they knew, he knew. He was trained on how to, this is what Saul is. Saul is the biggest threat that they have, and he knows even when they're going to try to kill him. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. You have to understand how the city worked. Uh, cities were walled. You couldn't get in and out except by key entrances. And so it'd be like, it'd be like a house. It'd be like us down here in the shelter. There's only two ways out of here. You go out this door and up if you can, and that's like, oh, you can climb out through the hole here. <laughs> they would know that too if they were trying to get us. So you can climb out through there, or you can go through the two doors. That's it, right? Or the bathroom, so. Okay, it's four doors, okay. Every door, imagine, every door is, is staked off by somebody's up there waiting. That's what they were doing to Saul. So he was, he was the city gate was being watched, and, and they were waiting to kill him. But his followers, it didn't take long for him to get followers, too. I mean, this guy just got saved, and then he's got disciples. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So they weren't looking at this particular space. They lowered him down through the thing. So 
when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a, or was really a disciple, which is understandable. If he had gone through the, the, what he had done before, they knew that they were not above, the Pharisees were not above using deceptive means to, to find out who was who. And so they just had trouble believing who he was. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. See, now he's, been, he's having to be established in the eyes of the believers. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. Everywhere he went, somebody wanted to kill him. It didn't take him long because once, once, once again, once you refute and, and, and you cannot possibly get gainsay, then they'll just want to destroy you. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And that's the only hope he has now is to just leave the air. He's, he's basically making trouble wherever he goes, which is just like his, his master Jesus. Wherever Jesus went, he had to leave because it was a mess. He had to move on and move on and move on. And it's really no different than what the church was doing in Jerusalem anyway. They had to move on because it was, they made a mess of things with the truth. And that's how powerful the gospel is. Once the, once the gospel starts to go out and touch people, it changes them to the extent that it disrupts society and the way that the government likes things and the way that society wants things and culture dictates it has to be, that's going to be all disrupted. All of our lives are disrupted by what the Holy Spirit's doing in this room. In this room. Our lives are ruined. I mean, our families are angry at us. This is the problem with the gospel. The gospel ruins you. Destroys your life. If you, you lose your life. You know, you could try to find a way to create it and save it and fix it, but then you lose that life, the Scripture says. But if we lose this life and we, and we refuse to accept the cultural norms and standards so that we can just fit in, be in harmony with everyone, we, we can't do that. Because if you do that, you save your life. And then you lose the real life that He's offering. But if you take that life and say, to hell with this life. I want the real life. And you accept the truth of the gospel. You get radical for Jesus and you make the kind of statements and say the kind of things that need to be said. You're going to be hated and rejected and even want, they're going to want to kill you because you argue. It could be the same in your families. You tell them the truth and they don't accept it. You should never let yourself get put in a position where you don't speak to your family about Jesus. You should always have to say, well, no, you always bring it. They're going to get mad every time, every time, but just do it with a smile. Make sure you stand your ground and make trouble all the time. But see, that's government doesn't like that. Government doesn't want a sect or a group that causes problems in society. That's absolutely, that's against the agenda of any guy. Government wants to keep peace and order, wants everyone to be happy and, and you know, to just get along. And, you know, they want, but that's really not what the gospel does when it's truly freely spoken of. Now, we don't have to be aggressive. We don't have to be judgmental of people. We just have to speak the truth. But the truth can be very offensive to people who are not accepting it. Even if you are, you can be as kind as you want. Like the time I had a very civil conversation with a man here in Singapore, and I told he asked me questions, so I told him what I believed. And I said, and Jesus is, you know, Jesus is the way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And then the only way we can go to heaven is through Jesus. And he said, well, I don't believe that. And I said, well, whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. It's a fact. He said, yeah, but I don't believe that. I said, once again, it does not matter if you believe it or not believe it. I was being very civil. If you believe it or not believe it, it's an absolute fact, kind of like gravity. Jesus is real. Jesus is God. He did die on the cross, and there's no way around it. That's your own way to heaven. No, but you don't understand. I don't believe it. I said, it's irrelevant. Whether you believe it or not, it's a fact. It's like saying, I don't believe in the sun. 
the sun is shining, if you can have all the faith that it doesn't exist, but it's going to keep on shining. So you can believe whatever you want, but Jesus is still Lord. And, and every knee will bow. And every, he was getting red. He was so mad. I don't believe that. I said, sir, it really doesn't matter if you believe it or not. I'm just telling you. I said, you don't have to get angry. You choose. I said, it is your right, sir. It is your right to burn forever in the lake of fire. You can do that. If that's your choice, I respect your choice to suffer eternally if you want to. But I don't believe that I will. Once again, whether you believe it or not, it's a fact. You will suffer eternally in the lake of fire. It's my obligation to make that statement and make it simple. So you don't have to believe it if you don't want it. You're right to not believe the truth. But I don't see it as the truth. It doesn't matter whether you see it as the truth or not. In other words, I, didn't let, I did not give any ground. I just stood on the truth. You can do it calmly, but yes, it will cause anger. But I guarantee you that man went home and he thought about that for days and days. Every time he would try to console himself with, well, that, I just don't believe that. He'd hear, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it was, you know, my words were haunting you for days and days and days. We need to plant seeds like that in people. That's love. That's love. That's telling the truth in love. They need to know. They, they, I cannot let people who've come into my company and have spoken to me ever say to me in that final day when we are separated in the category sheep and goats and they look it over, over from the goat pen at me in the sheep pen and say, you didn't tell me. They're not going to be able to do that. I'm going to be able to say, actually, I did. Remember I said, and whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. Well, now you know, but too late. Sorry about that. No, shut up, I'm watching the lion. Because then it's not going to make any difference what you tell them. You can't get people saved in heaven. So there's no purgatory, like some religions teach. It's, it's one of the other. Explaining that to my little six-year-old yesterday. Part of her lesson was the name Jesus for her to write it and, and you know, practicing her, her writing and things and in God. And she said, so Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. She said, but they're all God. And I said, right. So we had the most intelligent conversation to date about God. She almost got saved yesterday. She's coming to that edge right now. She could see her little wheels turn in her head. I've had the privilege of leading all of my children to the Lord. Not every parent gets to do that, really. Sometimes it usually doesn't happen that way. But I've had the privilege of intelligently explaining the gospel to each of my children and praying with them to receive Jesus as Savior. And Sarah Jane's that close. That close. Her little mind is trying to figure it out. I had explained to her hell very clearly. What psychologist would recommend that you tell a six-year-old about the lake of fire and the details of it and what suffering is? <laughs> See, I'm crazy. I, I would be found as a lunatic. What father would... I have I, very detailed. Very detailed. Told her about flesh burning off the body and how we would melt and, and that you would see the pain of it but you would never die. And the pain goes, she's listening to me but I, was, I have to tell the truth. And that's the truth. That's all we need to do is tell the truth. All Saul is doing is telling the truth. He's just speaking the truth. He knows it for a fact now. They're trying to tell him it's not true. They're trying to say, but the, it, it can't be. And he says, but it is. I'm sorry. Jesus is the Christ. But, but, but. And they would throw something else back at him and then he would come back. He would not relent. What they want you to say is, well, you know, everybody's got to choose their own way. That's a cop out. There's only one way. Either you believe it or you don't. If you think, well, everybody's got to find their own, you know, who knows, maybe there is another. You believe that, you're going to hell. That's a dangerous road to walk on. You start thinking multiple possibilities. Well, you don't really know what's in someone's heart. And maybe, you know, in the little village in Africa where they've never heard the gospel. Maybe. No. 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 Jesus is the only way. Saul knew this. Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. Jesus is the way. And if you stand for that, people are going to want to kill you for standing for that. They're going to either they're either going to walk away from you or they're going to try to kill you. And Saul 
And of course, it was a public figure raised by God as an instrument of the Lord to do this. And so he's doing it to the best of his ability and so much so that they had to take him and send him away, letting him down through a hole in the city wall and then sending him off and, uh, you know, all these things he's going through. And then finally in Jerusalem, he was free to preach and teach and be there until the Grecian Jews wanted to kill him. So he's basically working his way through societal group after societal group and becoming a target of hatred in those groups far telling the truth. And it is avoidable by keeping your mouth shut. But then we think of the scripture in Ezekiel, what God told Ezekiel, you keep your mouth shut, the blood of those people is on your hands. Make sure that you tell them, speak the truth. We go to the next, a summary report of the church, this is letter C. By the time we are working our way to the end of Acts chapter 9, then... The church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. Now, this is interesting. If the church, the ecclesia, throughout the whole state or province of Judea, all the way up to Galilee, by the Sea of Galilee, stretching downward toward the Dead Sea, north of the Dead Sea, to the, to the west, where Jerusalem was, that whole region, it says, Galilee, and up even of the part that they usually avoided by going across there, this side of the Jordan, there was this amazing time of peace. The church was given a place of rest. And, and it was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers living in the fear of the Lord. Now, if you think of this church that's given this rest, rest from what? This peace that they're given is because this persecution has backed off. Why? Because there was a season when the statement had to be made, and you'll find this trend, there is rising up a vast persecution, and then you'll find a trough where God will afford you rest so that you can strengthen and grow, but don't get too comfortable down there. The time's coming for you to go back out to war. And so you're on a rotation service program in the Lord. You, have, you get deployed, and then you come back in your rest. Then you get deployed, and God brings you through these levels. And the church now is at this time of peace. We've seen the, the um, action. We've seen the adversity. We see the authority. See, God's solution, and this is, remember, this is our template for how we can operate. God's solution for the resistance that became extreme to the church was solved with one blast of light. Just one, God solved the problem just like that. Shoom, a beam of light. Saul of Tarsus, struck and, stricken blind, falls to the ground. This communication, he's saved. Apparently he was the king then because if he hadn't been, the persecution would have continued because somebody else would have taken up the baton of his position, but apparently not. He was really the catalyst for all the persecution. People were gaining strength from that man, Saul, to fight against those of the way. And when he was gone and in fact preaching Jesus to them, now they're confused. Who are they going to follow? And this man was going to be followed no matter what. So as soon as he started, he made that 180 degree turn and started going the other direction. Immediately you see that his followers, within just a couple of weeks, he was already in a mentor position as a proclaimer of the truth of Jesus Christ. And one of the best preachers anybody ever heard, people said, we got to follow this guy. So a lot of those people were probably um, older believers than him. And decided, I'm just going to go with, with what he has to say. And they followed him. And this changed, the tide was turned and it changed the spiritual climate and the atmosphere of the whole region for this season. And the church gained a certain amount of respect. And, and during that time, it was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does both of those things. He strengthens you. He encourages you. He's the counselor, the consoler, the one that comes. But He also gives you power and strength. And as a result of that strength and that time, people could come and the church could grow in numbers. 
which means people came, they heard the word, and the word fell on the fallow ground that was prepared and actually had enough time to grow and they become believers in the church and stayed in the church. I've lived long enough in the ministry to see that process through years play out. I was looking at some pictures this morning of uh, uh, back from 26 years ago in, in ministry when I was working in Mexico and I saw many faces in a class photo and some other pictures from some relationships I've had and and I could see the people and and see what they're doing now versus what they were doing then and and the strength the, and I know all their stories and how hard it was for those people to become solid believers but once they become solid how they all grew into ministers and all the people in that picture are there I know I can name the pastor of the churches that they're pastoring I mean, literally in that picture just was a group of believers like most of them are pastors of churches and their churches have 1500 2000 members each of the churches this is just in 25 years that's, that's not a very long time if you think about it so we just need to focus. If we focus, if we endure, if we refuse to back off, yes, we will suffer persecution, but a time of rest and growth will come too. So we stand our ground, we keep moving forward. Sometimes it's like that, that three steps forward, two steps back scenario. You, you fight, you go, you move, you take three steps, and then you have to take two steps back. But at least you gain a step. But then you take three more steps, two steps back. Three more steps, two steps back. But it constantly grows. I have never seen the gospel not grow. I've never seen, I've never seen the gospel once released. In itself, it's so powerful, the seed of the kingdom. It's so powerful that even when put in a bad environment, even when covered with religious dogma and lies even when embedded in, in religiosity and politics and all the bad things it still grows it still makes the truth of Jesus no matter where you put it it will be successful because it's his word that he has sent forth and his word will never return void without accomplishing what his word is so powerful. That's why we need to depend upon the message that he gave us, the truth that he gave us. Rest in it and we're going to be strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will always, always, always be there. The Holy Spirit's there in the persecution. He's there in the good times. You pay less attention to him in the good times. You get very buddy-buddy chummy with him when you're being persecuted. But we need to be there in the good times. I've purposely over the last few months have uh, disciplined myself since the first of the year. Uh, actually last, uh, yeah, a month and a half now. And before that. I've disciplined myself to, to really focus. I always do this. I don't know what's new about it. But anyway, it's always new. But really focus every day on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, atmosphere of strengthening and encouragement from the Holy Spirit with my father and it's been it was amazing this morning it was amazing yesterday he just from the very first from the for the time I, I, for the time i sit down like I, I sometimes it's like it's so funny because it's like i'm going on a date and i'm making my coffee and i know that table's there and i'm gonna sit and talk to him and I, should, I get like shy and I make my cup and I put my cup of coffee down and I sit down and, and, and I pretend like I'm going to do it and I know what's about to happen. I said, and I say, Lord, and shoosh, it's all over me. And the weird thing is my hands lately have been coming. I've never, ever done this before. It's weird. My hands are coming up by themselves into a prayer position and they're going to my face. I've never done that before. I've never been a prayer like, you know that Hollywood, I've been doing it uncontrolled. As soon as I get there, the first thing I do is like, my hands go to my face and tears just stream down my face. And he just starts talking. It's been so, so lovely. <laughs> Strength, encouragement by the Holy Spirit. I don't even know where I am right now. I don't even know where I am. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> He's just so sweet. <laughs> He's so sweet. He's so loving. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for strengthening us. Thank you for encouraging us. Never go away. We'll keep seeking. We'll keep going. After. We're not going to back up. <laughs> we're going to stand our ground and we're going to keep moving forward. We may stumble. We may fall. We may lose ground on occasion, but we're going to keep going. If it takes the rest of our life fighting and struggling and, and, and stretching ourselves, it would be worth every second. Every second. Just to be in your presence one more second. I would, I would give everything. Just to have one, one more minute with me. You were going away and I could keep everything I have and you leave now. Or you're going to go away anyway, but if I give up everything, you give me 60 more seconds, I would go to leave. Give everything just for those 60 more seconds. Because life 